Welcome, friends. To the How-To Heretic. I'm Uncle Mark. And I'm Uncle Dan. And I am Uncle Doug. And this is your user's guide to life on the outside. That's right. Leaving religion is the first step into a larger, better world. But it can also be a scary world. (laughs) Things work differently now. Never fear. That's why we're here. We're your audio uncles. And with help from good friends and experts in all sorts of fields, we're going to share the stories and seek the knowledge to build a great life. After all, you only get the one that we know of, so you'd better make the most of it. Amen. Guys. Hello. Hello. How are you? Oh, you know, just uh, chilling. I am still um, on cloud nine from our, our meetup. Oh, yes. I, and you know, it's funny. We've gotten a few emails that I think people maybe misunderstood the date or something. And so I had to tell them, I'm sorry, it was last week and they were just shattered. That was so crazy fun. Yeah. yeah. Thanks, everyone who joined in. It, honestly, it's the most fun I have had since this darkness descended upon the land. <laughs> I, I don't know that it's nice to call my presence darkness on, on the <laughs> land, but, but uh, it was just so cool to see everybody's faces and have everybody participate. And, you know, we had our friends, you know, we had uh, Taro in Finland and Paul in in Singapore, and we had our friends in Australia. We had friends in New Zealand, all over the U.S. It was so great. People got out of bed in the middle of the night. Uh, yeah, and it, and it turns out that pretty much everybody in the great state of Pennsylvania is a fan of the show. That's true. That That's we true. we kind of Pennsylvania jammed the lines. I don't know what was going on, but you guys <laughs> you guys cleaned up. So uh, uh, it was fantastic. Uh, we love to see your your beautiful faces and your beautiful kids' faces and your beautiful pets' faces. It was uh, it was a good shot in the arm as we all wait around for a, an actual shot in the arm, right? <laughs> right. So we're lo- and and we'll do another one. I'm convinced yeah. that we'll do another one. We haven't decided on a date and time yet. But if you want to be a part of it, you can you can already start to. I mean, I, I assume Uncle Mark didn't throw away all of the email addresses, but uh, send in an email with Zoom in the in the subject line, and and we'll make sure you're. Well, you know you what? Don't miss so so it, I don't go crazy trying to keep track. Why don't we just wait until we announce a date and then rude rude? Yeah, <laughs> yeah it makes it easier. I'm, you can send. And, you can still send the word Zoom to me. It's fine, but. <laughs> if you if you want feedback or if you have feedback for us, just please understand, Uncle Doug will not be the pilot of the plane next time. So you can leave that feedback out <laughs> to, of your complaint. To all the people who came and were allowed in after the halftime show, <laughs> someone else will be driving the ship next time. So, but it was yeah. awesome. Thank you. We love you. Uh, it was great. And uh, and th- all of this is just to say, if you missed it, you should feel left out. Yeah. Truly. You should just jump jump out a window. So uh, we have a fun show this week. Uh, uh, Doug, you're going to introduce us to, to some to nobody, really. Yeah, I'm going to introduce us to a, what was once one of the world's great religions and now is no more, the Manichaeans. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then I am going to uh, talk to us all about uh, our eating problem. Yes, uh, and and how to fix it, and and then I am going to have part two of our interview with uh, Jared Yates Sexton, the the author uh, and journalist, who is going to tell us the good news about theocracy in America. So just be ready for some happy talk. <laughs> Shouldn't take Woo-hoo! long. Yeah, and then uh, you know other shit's happening. You, our YouTube uh, channel is is populating. We're over there at How to Heretic. Uh, our friend Vern has broken the show into. Well, we broke the show, but he's broken yeah. it into segments. So if you have uh, a relative that you think or a friend might uh, benefit from one of the individual segments, go ahead and send it to him that way. And then, guys, don't forget the merch. Part of our meetup was a fun game, a guessing game, a visual game, great for a podcast, about uh, uh, guessing some, some images from post, a poster I've created of oh, some of our guys. favorite segments. you got to see this poster. It's actually Amazing. Uncle Mark, you did a beautiful job. Uh, Thank you. Doodling all of the best of our segments. Uh, it's all the super fans should go and check it out and just you can go through and you will you'll recognize a bunch of them. Some of them are harder than others. So see yeah. how well you can do with with figuring out what each of the things is. Yeah, it's super fun. You can find that at our merch store. And, and I thought the game was going to be harder. But Hiram, our friend in Montreal, that dude mopped the floor with me. 
that he was so good. He knew everything. Yeah. So uh, maybe they're I'll, not as hard as I thought they most were. Most of the people who participated in that quiz were pretty fucking spot on. I, I, was, yeah, I, I was only impressed. got like three out of 20 and, and several of the ones I didn't get were my segments. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> totally. Yeah. So check it out. It's super fun. And uh, I think it's also, it's, it's also on some other stuff. It's on blankets. It's on notebooks. So all that makes should, a sense. We should get some blankets. We should get some Indeed. blankets to settle in. So yeah. with that, guys, enjoy the show and uh, see you on the other side. To who? Um, Uncle Dan. Hello. Yes. Question. Uh, I, you know, there's that old saying that everything old is new again. Mm-hmm. Including that saying. Including that saying. And I think it's. I think it's it's fifty percent completely true and fifty percent utter bullshit. <laughs> and I just and I think it's because both sides, right? And so I, I want to see if Uncle Doug can prove one of those two suppositions I've just created in a certain singularity. I am up to the challenge. So oh, wow. Well, Lord, well, dear uncles, we often talk about um, on this show about how history is crowded with dead gods and the religions they represented. Sure. And how about in our world seemingly dominated by only a handful of major religions, there's an abundance of tiny sects, both ancient and new, um, in often surprising places. Mm. Uh, today's subject, however, is about a major religion that through concerted effort by pretty much everybody is no longer with us, but that once stretched Scientology. The... <laughs> I wish. <laughs> uh, it's on death's wish. door, but it's still here. <laughs> uh, this religion once stretched from the Atlantic coast of France to the Pacific coast of China – from North Whoa. Africa to, to the Central Asian steppe. Um, it was that's pretty not much small. That's a, yes. that's a large bit of land. It's teeny tiny. Yeah. Um, it's a huge tract of land. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, it was pretty much present at every major inflection point from the 3rd to the 13th centuries. And if any one of a thousand events had played out just a little bit differently, world history would have played out very differently as well. Uh, I guess that's true of pretty much anything in history, right? Mm. You're talking um, about the religious butterfly effect. Right. <laughs> um, however, that's not what happened. And by the 14th century, one of the world's greatest religions died alone and lonely in China. So today let's talk about the rise and fall of Manichaeism. Um, pronouncement disclaimer. I'm going to say a bunch of words in, um, from Persian Manichaeism to ancient Jewish Gnosticism to Tibetan Buddhism to Mongolian shamanism. And I'm going to say them wrong. Unless you are, in fact, an ancient Gnostic Jew or a 13th century Mongol raider, leave me alone. <laughs> and also, just leave me alone. <laughs> just leave me alone. <laughs> and if you're not one of those, also, please leave me alone. <laughs> right. So Manichaeism is based on the extensive teachings of one man, Manny. Um, oh, I know. really? Yeah, just one dude named Manny, and that's the whole name of the religion. <laughs> Manny, Manny, down at a, the, at the, Manny down at the tire shop. Exactly. You know Manny. Yeah. Oh, sure. He's Victor's, great. Oh. Victor's brother. Yeah. That guy, he will he will change your your flat in no time, yeah. and he will start a religion without you even batting an eye. <laughs> like ten thousand years ago, he's oh amazing. god, <laughs> this is such a tangent. But you just got me thinking about uh, there's a place in Salt Lake called Victor's Tire Shop. Yeah, uh-huh. that is a literal like Mexican tire shop with a with a little taqueria, and you can oh, order you order the tacos where you like get your tire where you pay for your tires, and it's really good. The tacos are so good. I yeah. just keep, I'm so <laughs> desperate for that place to get back open so I, I can go visit. But, it's really good. How are the tires? Uh, the tires are mediocre, a little okay. salty. <laughs> uh, Manichaeism was based uh, on on the um, oh pardon me let me back up. Man- Manny was a Persian born in 216. Seleucia Sestaphon in modern-day Iraq. Um, his parents were members of a small Jewish Christian Gnostic sect called either Elkasiites or Elsasiites. Not sure which. Okay. Um, many believed that Gautama Buddha, Krishna, Zoroaster, and Jesus were all divine, but their teachings were incomplete. Um, he believed in the life of Jesus, especially because if it actually happened, he was just stone throw away and only a couple centuries late. Um, but he believed that most of the story was mystical rather than literal. Hmm. Um, his main theological preoccupation was the problem of evil. Hmm. His theology would become sure. strongly dualistic, teaching that the universe was in a war between good and evil, light and dark, uh, that God was good but not totally omnipotent, and that he was opposed by a nearly equal power of darkness or the devil. Um, hmm. This battle raged all around us and within us. Flesh was not intrinsically evil, but possessed by portions of the light or portions of the dark. 
Um, this cosmic struggle that raged around us manifested itself in violent weather and natural disasters. Was Jesus' last name in this theology Skywalker? Because I'm starting to hear similarities. (laughs) It's kind of funny because it's not that far off. Um, Tomorrow is May 4th, guys. That's true. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, Manny wrote at least seven books in several languages, including a later variety of Aramaic called Syriac and a Middle Persian language called Pahlavi. See above disclaimer. These books made it the very complicated cosmogony of, the, of Manichaeism, which reads more like an ancient Middle Eastern Game of Thrones. Um, nothing but fragments of the original work exist, and what we know is based on either other accounts or oral traditions. Uh, however, like I said, it borrowed heavily from all of the major and minor religions of its place and time. Hmm. There was an extensive creation story with wars and betrayal and drama, all of it predating the creation of Adam and Eve. Um, the spirit of Jesus himself was sent to awaken Adam and teach him about the light and the dark. So there's your Jesus Skywalker. Um, I guess maybe Jesus Kenobi. Um, (laughs) It's very dense, and like all mythology, it's a complete mess. But the gist of it is that this reality wasn't necessarily created on purpose, and it wasn't created by God, who now wages a universe-wide war with the forces of darkness (laughs) that we must also wage within ourselves. The ending is not written, and we are the masters of our own fate. Um, this notion, okay, this is a clear improvement on the monotheism of the time. You could call it that. I mean, it's, and, yeah. and as we see, it's not without its problems, but it is an interesting way to deal with the problem of evil, right? Instead of an all powerful, um, all, you know, knowing God that right. then we have to square the circle of why there's plagues. Right. We have a God in a pitched battle, a good God in a pitched battle with evil, which is why good and bad things happen. No, nope, there's yeah. that. So and, it's slightly, and, yeah. it's like deism a little bit. It's kind of deistic, yep. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and it's, I mean, and I am, please understand, I am only scratching the surface of this religion. Mm. Uh, this notion that man can elevate himself and then the dualistic nature of the faith would prove to be its undoing um, as it tried through battle with more fatalistic authoritarian religions throughout history. Uh, the Manichaean church was very highly organized. It was divided into, into two main groups. The elect, or clergy, and the hearers, or the lay people. Hmm. The elect was led by a supreme type leader with 12 apostles, 72 bishops, and 300, 360 presbyters. Uh, the elect were forbidden from drinking alcohol and eating meat and could not harvest crops or prepare food. Harvesting was considered murder of plants. So the hearers <laughs> would, would harvest and prepare the food for the elect, who would then in turn forgive them for that very act. Oh, my God. <laughs> As with every religion in history. Getting a little intense there. Yeah, it quite literally pays to be on the payroll. (laughs) uh, They had a very complex set of rituals. The hearers hearers had to pray four times a day, while the elect had to pray seven times a day. During the prayers, they would do 12 burpees. Kind of not kidding. (laughs) Really? Yeah, 12 times during their prayers, they had to prostrate themselves and then get back up. Oh, Um, so it was uh, kind of like the Islamic... Uh, they're, yeah, one, and they're like yeah, it's, all the way it upright. Was CrossFit, all the way upright. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's totally, it's totally CrossFit. Uh, during the day, they would face the sun. At night, they would face the moon. And if the moon were not visible, they would face north when they prayed. Okay. Yeah. Sure. Why not? Why not? Uh, Manichaeism, like Christianity, was people an just want a direction. Just pick a pick a direction. They don't really care. <laughs> now we have every direction but south now. Uh, yeah. Manichaeism, like Christianity, was an evangelistic faith, and Manny and his early followers worked very hard to sell their new religion, and they did so with remarkable speed. Within a few short years, it had spread to Rome and Western Europe and was a strong influence when in 312, Constantine converted to Christianity. Here's one of the many points in the story where there is at least the possibility that the world could have rolled out very differently had one tiny thing been altered. Uh, it seems that Christianity was more of a presence in Rome, uh, in the Roman Empire in 312, but Manichaeism was definitely the flavor of the month. Had Constantine decided that Manichaeism suited his strategic needs more than Christianity, it's impossible to contemplate how different our modern world would be. But I alas. Think, I, I think you mean had the Lord not told Constantine the truth about Jesus. Correction then. accepted. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> But alas, he didn't, and Manichaeism would, be, would begin to contend with the violent forces that would, over the next 10 centuries, extinguish it from the face of the earth. Uh, Manny was the first to suffer this fate when he ran afoul of Zoroastrian clergy in Persia and was put to death in 276 or 277. 
Um, in the late third century, Christians would spin a tale of Emperor Diocletian, uniquely persecuting Christians by throwing them to lions and setting mm-hmm. them on fire. Mm. Uh, it appears that these accounts have been at least exaggerated. Yeah, we've talked about him on the show quite a bit before. Mm-hmm. Yeah, or the Diocletian it, terror. Yeah, it's possible that these stories were actually conflated with the Manichaeans, towards whom Diocletian lived up to his legend. Mm. In 296, Diocletian decreed that all Manichaean leaders be burnt alive on piles of their own scriptures. Whoa. Um, wow. Yeah, that's something, isn't it? That's um, gilding the lily, man. Just – Right? For, yeah. Just, yeah, just kill them. You, you don't have to get all flowery about okay, it. Okay, I, I get it. You're proving your point. You um, want to burn the books? You want to burn the people? Right. Can it be both? <laughs> uh, after years of persecution, the moment that Christians got some power – they immediately demanded that the Roman Emperor the- uh, Theodosius I strip Manichaeans of their civil rights, which he happily did. But Theodosius didn't stop there, and by 382, he issued a decree for the death of all Manichaean priests. Jesus. Fun mm-hmm. fact, St. Augustine of Hippo spent 10 years as a Manichaean before converting to Christianity in 387. Interesting. Really? Mm-hmm. What? Yeah. Augustine. St. Augustine was a Manichaean before converting directly to Christianity. Huh. Um, and this was at least convenient as Theodosius had issued his death warrant only a few years earlier and would go <laughs> on to declare Christianity the only uh, religion of Rome in 391 just a couple <clears throat> years later. So it is thought, therefore, by some that Augustine's conversion was not as sincere as he made it out to be. Hmm. And although he became a strong enemy of Manichaeism, it seems as though he injected a ton of Manichaean teachings into the early Christian church. So it's a little bit dense to go into here, but the dualism of St. Augustine kind of comes from his Manichaean background. That's so fascinating because he's, you know, he's one of the, the kind of the architects of, of hell, right? He's one right. of the, the proponents, right. early church proponents of hell, and he was a, a, just a terrible shitbag in a lot of other ways. So one wonders, yeah. you know, if that – those – now I have to look into it. Thanks. You're welcome. Yeah. Uh, the Roman persecution in that area was so effective that Manichaean, Manichaeism virtually disappeared from Western Europe in the 5th century <clears> – <throat> pardon me – and from most of Eastern Europe by the 6th. However, it, la- it managed to last for some centuries in several small pockets of Mesopotamia, Africa, Spain, France, Northern Italy, and the Balkans before being extinguished. It also did quite well in the Uyghur region of Central Asia with hmm. Kagan Boku Tekin, the leader of the, Uy- the Uyghur Kaganite, joining the religion, effectively making it the state religion until the fall of the Kaganite in 840. So it was a massive influence in Central Asia. It survived it's, for it's, a short It's easy to make up words, Doug. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not. Think, of, you know, like read the Book of Mormon. You can't make up those names. <laughs> oh, that's true. That's a good point. It can't be done. It's like literally not a possible thing. <laughs> um. Manichaeism did survive alongside the booming new religion of Islam for a time, uh, especially since they shared a geographic point of origin. However, Islam decided to earn its reputation for not getting along with other religions early on, and concerted efforts were undertaken in the Islamic world to stomp out Manichaeism as early as 780. Mm. Um, But for a short time, during the life of Muhammad and directly after his death, Manichaeism had a chance to hold off its new regional competitor – but Islam was designed for conquests and Manich- Manichaeism was not. Hmm. It had its yeah. day in Tibet in the 8th and 9th centuries before being uprooted and fully replaced by Tibetan Buddhism. And it survived in, in the cent- Central Asian steppes until the Mongol invasions of the 13th century. And although Genghis Khan was crazy tolerant of religious freedom, Manichaeism did not flourish under the Mongols. Huh. Uh, it appears as though it made its last stand in China until it was officially banned by the Ming Dynasty in 1370. And that oh, these was, guys, they can't catch a fucking break. Yeah, right? Yeah. And that was that for one of the world's largest religions, as it seems that Manny had set out to design a religion that borrowed heavily from all religions around it in order to please all those religions. He succeeded in creating a religion that nobody wanted. <laughs> um, as it became associated with idolatry and dualism, some people were accused of being Manichaeans and burned for it during the Inquis- Inquisition, although they were almost certainly false charges. Uh, the destruction of Manichaeism was so total that only one fully intact Manichaean temple still exists in China, in the whole world. Hmm. Huh. Um, there are several small groups that claim to carry on some part of the Manichaean tradition, but it's become so infused and kind of hard to, to differentiate from Buddha, Buddhism 
that no one can prove them right or wrong. Uh, one thing is for certain, Manichaeism was one of the largest and most widespread religions in history. It was a viable competitor for every other major religion of the time and those that have survived to ours. Had it managed to fend off the rise of Islam or outpace Chinese Buddhism or find favor with just one Roman emperor or one Khan, we would be living in a very different world. But Interesting. I'm not going to say it, was a be- it would be a better one. There's nothing really within Manichaeism to make me think it would have been be- a better alternative to the religions it lost to, but it sure would be different. Um, I'm sure we would still have a podcast, but instead of inveighing against Jehovah or Muhammad or Joseph Smith, we'd probably be bitching about the King of Glory or the Twelve Virgins of Light or the Keeper of Splendor. <laughs> <laughs> the Keeper of Splendor. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, uh, it, you guys remember that Seinfeld episode where – there was like a Pakistani restaurant in the neighborhood and he went in there and it was the guy was struggling and he's like, you know what you should do? You should serve all cuisines. And so remember <laughs> that? And then the guy tried to like have Chinese, Pakistani, Mexican, Hawaiian. <laughs> right. And it was just a catastrophe, like even worse. Right. And uh, it kind of sounds like what Manny tried to pull off there, huh? Yeah, I think so. A little so. bit of this, a little bit of that, and pretty soon it's just a hot mess. Yeah, and I think one of the only upsides is that apparently through concerted effort, religions can be made to disappear. Just please don't tell anyone with a German accent or a MAGA hat. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so that's wow. a, a major world religion that is entirely extinct. I think yeah, I remember a, a revival of it that happened somewhere in the, the 1980s, though. Uh, I'm sure. Tri- they tried to bring it back with uh, Andrew McCarthy and Kim Cattrall, right? <laughs> oh, that's... <laughs> I'm it's totally manic- lost. Manichaeism. F- oh, my God. I'm like, what the fuck are you actually talking about? <sighs> <laughs> we know that we talked about the Zoroastrians a little bit. Same region, right? They came yeah. out of Persia and... <clears throat> yeah. and uh, and looked like they were going to be it for a while, and now they're down to I think there's tens of thousands left in the world, but not yeah. not many more than that. So, you know, for such an amazingly uh, powerful uh, region and 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 uh, uh, civilization, those Persians didn't make anything stick, did they? It seems like they had a hard time making shit stick. Oh well, well, and then the, the Muslims showed up, and that stopped. So, yeah. It's pretty sticky right now. Well, that, that was a fascinating look into our old friends, the Manichaeans. Well, and so so interesting because I had never heard of them. Yeah. And it seems mm. like it was so, like it, this was a major thing. This was huge. Yeah, and, and whose influence it, it, it is in Buddhism, it's in Christianity, um, it's definitely in Islam. So it, yeah. isn't that wild? Hmm. There you yeah. go. And, and again, with, with Augustine, who knows how it inf- – because – he infused so much of what became, you know, the, the yep. Catholic Church we know and Christianity. Hard to say how much of it, you know, it is in that DNA. Fascinating. All cool. right. Thanks, All Manny. Right. Let's move on. Let's Manny on. Uncle Mark. Yes. Um, in this time of crisis and, and, and virus, one would think that... Virus would crisis. Si- exactly. We'd be sitting in front of a single candle with a can of cream corn... Mm. Um, but you know, I'm getting plump. I am not eating. <laughs> well, I am I'm eating very well. Well, I, <laughs> that's a gross and bourgeois. And oh, and B, so there should probably be some rules about how and what you eat, Doug. Yes, uh, I'm Dan, for some do, rules. do you have any rules to to impart to Uncle Doug? No. Okay, <laughs> good. More crab legs. <laughs> uh, listen. Um, th- there may be some rules. I, I, I think we can talk about them, but before we do, uh, I just want to say, uh, this, uh, which is Webster's dictionary defines the word religion <laughs> as a system of faith and worship des- designed to provide adherence with a belief structure and practices that will make them look silly and possibly crazy to outsiders, but keep them psychologically trapped forever. Mission accomplished. <laughs> Direct quote. That was copied and pasted. (laughs) Nice. Um, One of the ways that religions exert control over the lives of their believers is through controlling what they eat and drink. Mm -hmm. Uh, Listeners may remember two weeks ago when Uncle Mark talked to cult expert Stephen Hassan. Hassan? Yeah. Hassan? Hassan. Hassan. Uh, Stephen Hassan about how cults and religions are so effective at trapping people's brains. Uh how is your cult coming along, by the way, Uncle Mark? Uh, have you uh, decided never, on a name yet? Never better. 
Never okay. better. Thank you. Good. Good. Yeah. Keep it up. Keep it up. It's, it's always good to have a side hustle. I'm, I, I'm, my side hustle right now is I'm struggling with a cat who wants to eat the microphone. So you guys keep talking. <laughs> okay. Ah, well, listen. Uh, what stood out to me in that in, in the Mark's interview was the idea that if you can get a person to change their behavior, their brains will twist themselves in knots trying to justify having acted so strangely. Right. It seemed like, to a large extent, the key to getting people to believe whatever you want them to believe was to make them behave in mm -hmm. a specific way. Almost doesn't matter what the behavior is as long as it's new and different. So, this new and different behavior creates an us-versus-them mentality. Mm -hmm. We, the in-group, are the righteous few who are brave enough to always wear mismatching socks, as our deity commands. <laughs> They, the out group, match their socks like filthy little heathens, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> so the pitch becomes actually quite easy, which is basically something along the line of, look, you don't have to decide right now if this is true for you or not. Just join us for a few meetings, hear what our charismatic leader has to say, and, oh, it's no big deal, but try mismatching your socks for the next little while. See what uh -huh. that does for you. We'll explain why in session six. Well, if you make it to session six, you've been doing the and you've been doing the sock thing the whole time. Congratulations! Without even knowing it, you've joined a cult. Call yeah. your dad. <laughs> uh, this trick of making your brain justify your behavior after the fact is a goof, goofy little quirk of human psychology, but it's super effective. And pretty much uh, every effective cult slash religious leader figures it out pretty early on. Today. Gentlemen, I'm going to talk about one way that religions uh, have created in-group versus out-group mentalities for thousands of years. Boggle tournaments. Yes. No, <laughs> no. I'm talking about aliment, comestibles, the act of gustation. In the modern vernacular, I am, of course, referring to boggle tournaments. No, food. <laughs> now, you, we three... Uh, gentlemen grew up in Mormonism, which experimented quite heavily with the other, with otherizing behaviors pretty early on. Uh, plural marriage, strange temple rituals cribbed from the Masonic rituals, but whatever. Mm -hmm. Funny magic <coughs> underwear, killing apostates, shitting on the darker races, fighting wars against entire states and even the USA. All of these were... And in some, and some still are ways that Mormonism uh, differentiated itself from the rest of the world. Yeah, it's um, pretty different stuff. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, but when you <clears throat> boil it down, the basics of it isn't different. You know what I mean? There's mm. almost nothing to really differentiate it from mainstream Christianity except just a couple of weirdo things, right? Yeah. So... Even after almost 200 years of chilling the fuck out and trying not to be such major weirdos, Mormons have still, still have their markers that show them and the world that, that they are special. Uh, the biggest one is their word of wisdom. This is the Mormon rule book uh, of food and drink and famously includes a prohibition on alcohol, hot drinks, and joy. Uh, <laughs> for more on this, you can check uh, episode 66 and uh, and and hear learn all about the word of wisdom. The word to wisdom. So, we know what it is. We, uh, you, you two, and I know what it is to see people eating and drinking perfectly normal things, and to know that they are bad, evil people. <laughs> uh, but Mormons are actually pretty late to the food rules game, and I thought we should take a, talk a bit about some of the other major major players. Uh, so, interestingly. A lot of the rules that religions developed ha happened not just to differentiate one group from another, but to show who was important within that group. Mm. Uh, we all know the rules. We all know about the rules in uh, Jewish kosher eating, for, for instance. Mm -hmm. No digging on swine, no mixing meat and dairy, shellfish is ucky, and of course, normal healthy digestion is strictly forbidden. Right. Uh, but... Why did these rule, rules develop? You know, I've seen a lot of theories about it. Some, some Bronze Age Hebrew got sick off a bad oyster and an overzealous rabbi banned it for everyone. 
Or maybe some king along the way hated pork and everybody else obliged for long enough that it just became their identity as a group. But I'm really interested in another theory, uh, which looks at cleanness versus uncleanness, sort of pollution versus purity of food, mm -hmm. which has nothing to do with what isn't what is or isn't healthy to eat. As a matter of fact, there's almost no way of determining why the ancients uh, designated one food as polluted and another as delightsome. Uh, this, of course, uh, is more just about it's, – it's more about just making sure that things are – some things are good and some are bad. So, yes, of course you can eat a quail, but obviously you can't eat an owl. Hmm. You know, squirrel? <laughs> probably. Weasel? No. <laughs> The rules are, about the, are not about the food itself, it's just about having rules. And the really fun part is that the rules apply differently depending on who you were. Hmm. So ancient Hebrews had what amounted to a caste system. People had higher or lower social rank based entirely on her heredity. Uh, the family that you were born into determined everything. So the highest class, the priest class had the most rules imposed on it, but also had some pretty sweet perks. Namely, the best stuff, meaning the good calf or the, quote, first fruits of the trees, mm. were supposed to be sacrificed to God, which is all well and good, but, you know, God never really showed up to take the stuff. So well, we're just going to take this back into our priest tent and, uh, well, don't you worry your pretty little head about what happens Don't worry to about it. Yeah, we talked about that in Leviticus, right? It's like, yeah, all the, all the finest animals were sacrificed and then you just kind of leave it there at the temple. Don't and worry, we'll take, we'll take care of it. We'll, we'll clean up. Don't worry. Yeah. You guys go ahead. God is pleased with you. Here's a little, little button and a gold star. You're good to go. Uh, of course, when you start using weirdo food laws as part of your religious identity, there's always the potential for things to get weirder. Uh, sure, the Torah has plenty of very specific rules about what you can and can't eat. Uh, see Uncle Doug's rundown way back in episode 9 for more. But uh, through the centuries, the, the Jewish rules have not only gotten more, have only gotten more intense, rather. Uh, around the first century CE, they started adding rules. Now, not only were, they, were there only certain animals that could be eaten, but they had to be slaughtered in very specific ways that aren't mentioned in the Bible. Hmm. Uh, that was all new. Celebrations and holidays started developing specific food and drink traditions, which eventually became more, more and more like laws. What to eat and drink at Passover, or how a wedding feast was meant to go, etc., etc., uh, of course, this isn't just a Jewish or a Mormon thing. Lots of religions uh, control. Lots of religions control what their adherents chow on. Islam drew heavily on Mosaic law when it came to what Muslims were to eat. Things like no pork, nothing mm -hmm. with blood in it, no roadkill. But Muhammad what needed to separate his Middle Eastern uh, Abrahamic religion from the other ones. So. He banned alcohol, which Jews and Christians relied on heavily for their rituals and for, you know, getting bombed out of their skulls. Getting through the day. <clears throat> right? Yeah. yeah. Just dealing with the shit. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> Hindus made rules, too. They famously decided somewhere along the way that cows are sacred and that it's a sin to even attempt to keep them out of busy traffic, let alone to eat them. Hmm. Uh, they, too, used and probably still use food as a marker of purity and social status. The caste system, uh, their caste system included very strict rules, not only about who could eat what, but even who could prepare what for whom. Hmm. So members of the Brahmin caste, which is, again, the priest class, because religion is about power, not holiness, couldn't eat food that had been cooked by someone of a lower caste. A drinking well could be considered polluted forever if someone from a low caste e had e ever even drawn water from it. Wow. We've Brahmins, never really we've never really done we need to do the whole caste system as a as a segment, don't we? Because we've never yeah, really it's a it's a kettle of fish, that's for sure. Yeah. Um so this high, the highest caste, these Brahmins, their food was to be prepared in the finest way called paka, while the people people of lower castes got inferior food, which I shit you not, is referred to as caca. 
<laughs> Lovely. <laughs> because sometimes the gods just favor 12-year-old Dan instead of 42-year-old Dan. Uh, there's a whole system of prestige surrounding who will eat what from whom. Uh, giving food to someone else meant that you were ranked higher than whoever was receiving. Hmm. Uh, refusing food from someone is a great way to tell them that you think that you think you're higher on the chain than they are. All of this amounts to a fantastic way to discourage house guests and not have your Netflix binge interrupted. <laughs> Different forms of Buddhists uh, have developed different rules. Native American tribes have all have all had various uh, fascinating uh, pre and proscriptions about food. Hmm. African traditional religions, island superstitions, Jim Jones, David Koresh—they all used food as a way of getting their followers to feel special or different, and that difference locked their brains in, into beliefs. And that's how you win. <laughs> so, uh, to this day, I, you know, it's funny because when you hear when you hear a lot of people talk about their diet, even if it's not a religious prescription, I think it starts to sound religious awful, awful quick. Oh, oh for sure. sure. <clears throat> like a vegan or a paleo or a keto. Yeah. Or a South Beach. We know who you yeah, people exactly. are. Yeah, exactly. I, you know, I eat based on my blood type. Blah blah blah. It's, right. It becomes this thing of I've converted to something. I and personally it, am on the Henry the Eighth diet right now. <laughs> <laughs> and there's I do so it well. many. There's so many turkey leg bones all over the house. It's crazy. <laughs> the number of pot pies is outrageous. <laughs> well, and and part, I, I don't know if you're going to get to this, Dan, but but uh, another part of the of the whole control around food and and behavior behavior modification and everything of course is no food at all right is fasting right. Um, that's absolutely the case yeah yeah and and mormons have i think they've done two or three big fasts so far to stop the coronavirus so i'm hopeful the third one's going to work well clearly it works because uh the curve is flattening so right. yeah. there you go and yeah <clears throat> uncle doug is fattening <laughs> no, I mean, f- fasting is an interesting thing. It happened. It that also has happened in many different traditions. There, I, there are certain Native American tribes that started their that start used to start their children on fasts really early on, like one to two day fasts, to build them up to a full week during which uh, they would be visited by, uh, you know, some spirit animal or spirit, you know, spirit guide. Which, if you've been fasting for a week, guess what? Something crazy is going to visit you. Oh, like if I don't <laughs> eat lunch by one thirty, everybody looks like a fucking turkey leg to me. So I understand <laughs> the hunger hallucinations completely. Yeah. And, then, and then, of course, there's Ramadan, right? There's the which is yeah. a, a, a a long-term intermittent fast, which I don't know how the fuck anybody can pull off. That's crazy to me. No, yeah. no food or water. Um, Till sundown. Yeah, during the daylight hours. So that's that's you know you know that it's, it's a true fact that many Muslims gain weight during Ramadan <laughs> because they really? binge so much after dark. <laughs> the binges are so intense. Yeah, yeah. Well, and and then they go straight to bed as opposed to like eating and working off those calories. They their I'm sure their body goes into some crazy mode. I was working but, with a guy, uh, <clears throat> a uh, an active Muslim guy on a on a movie years ago during Ramadan. And it was so miserable. He was a nice guy, but he would just, he was such an asshole during the day. <laughs> just, <laughs> you know, because we'd all go to lunch and he would, <clears throat> he just either wouldn't go or he'd sit there and watch us eat. And oh, like, torture. Torture. That's devotion, I suppose. He, he I didn't go. ever see him break it. So, well, and that's the kind of thing we're talking about, right? He's sitting there torturing himself. <clears throat> and far from that making him less likely to want to be a Muslim. It solidifies his identity as that thing and makes it so that he is even more sort of deeply embedded into it. Yeah, in his it, gave, own brain. it gave him a very powerful identity in the group, right? Like, exactly. It, he was, it was very clear what he was doing and that this was a very devotional thing. And so, yeah, fasting is a whole other part of that, uh, the control mechanism. Yep. Eating, not eating, weird stuff, whatever it is, it's all there to make sure that your brain is permanently locked in a belief system that doesn't make any sense. And so, that's why I am starting the Church of Spam. Yes, indeed. <laughs> I think, All right. I think uh, the Monty Python guys beat you to it, but... Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll write him a letter. 
Yeah, work with them. <laughs> all right. Anyway, cool. that's it. That's all. That that's all I got. So for that, I just wanted to sort of talk about the concept because I thought you know the uh, the whole. I really was fascinated by your interview with uh, with Stephen Hassan and just thought, oh yeah, this all makes a lot of sense. Yeah, he's a, he's a brilliant guy, and he, like you were saying about the, the like the paleo and everything, he definitely kind of lists those as cult like behaviors, like CrossFit and mm. and not you know. I'm sure we have plenty of people who eat paleo listening to the show and in CrossFit. I'm not saying you're necessarily in a cult, but just take a minute and look around. That's all I'm saying. Well, Next yeah, I mean, joke, you, uh, it, uh, a Scientologist, a Mormon, and a CrossFit person all walked into a bar. I know because they all told me right away. Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Except the Mormon. All right, cool. With that, uh, let's move on. Gentlemen. Hi. Hi. Hi, friends. Uh, look, we are, we're, we're just put, spewing stuff out into the universe, and sometimes the universe spews back. And <laughs> how great is that? Yeah. Uh, we, uh, we, we do have patrons. People, here's the thing. Our show's free. That's fine. If you, if you, if you just want to listen and, and, and that's, that's the extent of the interaction, Great. We have no problem with that. We have no truck with that. However, some people love it so much that they that they want to kick in a little bit of a few uh, pennies here and there, so that they can feel like they've uh, they've contributed. And boy, do we want to thank them! So uh, let let me just launch in with the thanks here. Thanks so much to Thomas, to Sith Lord Sexy Pants, <laughs> uh, Andrew. Master Debater, I'm sure you are. <laughs> uh, Melinda, Marissa, Aaron. Oh, nope. I'm not going to thank Aaron yet because one of you is going to thank Aaron. Hang on. Uh, mm -hmm. Marcus and Charlotte, Sheila. Damn. Thanks to Nathan. It's still going, guys. Uh, wow. Don't don't even sweat it. Uh, thanks to Pedro uh, and Catherine and Tim. Sheesh. Amazing. Wow. You guys, amazing. Uh, but we're not done yet because Uncle <clears throat> Mark, yeah. I need you to improvise, please, a saint for Kate. Oh, excellent. Kate. Well, this one is an easy one because I feel, I'm feeling your vibe very strongly. And I think that mm. you need the intercession of uh, Saint Tabitha of the Onions. And mm. uh, she's actually not the patron saint of onions, strangely enough. But uh, um, she's the patron saint of goiters sure. and goiter hobbyists and <laughs> Herb Albert, but not the Tijuana Brass. That's okay. a huge, long story we don't want to get into here. It's, it's just – it's really more stupid than, than – it's just long. So <laughs> congratulations on that, on, on St. Tabitha of the Onions. Uh, yeah. Amazing, amazing. And Uncle Doug, I'm, I'm going to let you uh, – bestow a patron saint upon Aaron. Aaron, okay. Aaron, you are going to need the the um blessings of Saint uh Saint Slarda Bartslow. Um <laughs> anyone who can write in and tell me what that reference is and how I changed it, you you'll win a prize. I can just say um, it now. <laughs> uh Saint Slarda, Slarda Bartslow of Milling of Millings, Billings, Montana. Mm. Or, um, or Millings, Montana. Or Millings, Montana. <laughs> he can be in two places at once. Yeah. yeah. Just, just not very quickly. Um, he is the patron saint of foreign-born water buffalo, mm. um, the Doppler effect, <laughs> and um, all bullion-based soups. All oh. right. That's a heavy hitter. That's a heavy hitter. <laughs> That's, that, was, that was that saint going over my head. Uh, Y'all, you guys are amazing. Thank you so much for all of your kindness and yeah. your willingness to help out in these darkest of times. Um, you you make it light. And look yeah. at that. Uh, so if anybody else wants to shed some light on the darkness, please feel free to go to howtoheretic.com uh, and find the support us business the little uh, button there. And then that'll take you to Patreon and you too can be one of the people that we thank on the show. Damn, Skippy. And if you can't do that, stars are free. So go there, hit that five button. It's five or die, bitches. Five or die. We love you, everybody. Thank you so much. Yeah, moving on. Hey, 
Hey, Heretics. Uh, in case you missed last week, you might want to go back and listen to part one of my interview with Jared Yates Sexton, uh, where we talked about um, theocracy in America, starting with the theocratic Confederate States of America and how that poison continues to infect us. Uh, you might want to listen to that before this, which is part two of that interview, where we uh, get caught up in, into uh, the modern age with theocracy in America. So uh, enjoy. <laughs> I think what is baffling to people who did not come from religious backgrounds like we do, Jared, is they they can't understand the Christian right in America and this looming theocracy because it seems so fucking incoherent. Yes. Right. Yeah. That how could how could these very pious religious people who will scream outside of women's health clinics then turn around and support a person who is the seven deadly sins made flesh for president, right? Right. And what you end up finding out is that it's all malleable ideology, right? Right. It's their ability to weaponize what they say they believe against other people. It's the exact same way that the Trump administration uses the law, right? The law uh -huh. doesn't apply to them. It applies to other people. All of a sudden, exactly the, right. the law is there to rein in other people and control other people. It's here for me as a tool to use. And I didn't understand the full scope of it because I, I knew there was something about the hypocrisy of the church that led to it supporting Donald Trump. And for a while, I just thought it was a Jimmy Swagger type thing, right? Like, uh -huh. you know, the big hair, the suits, the the boisterousness, the, the the open sins, because Trump, when you really look at him, is, is a televangelist. That's who he is. Yeah, he's and a tacky fucking carnival barker. He's a disgusting, just greasy person who bilks everybody yeah. out of their money for power. So then I started going back for this book, and I didn't – expected to go down this route. Again, I, I kind of, I started at the very beginning of American history and I just kept finding these bizarre things that really shocked me, right? Yeah. That made American history a lot more obvious. And, and that history, the one that I found for the book, American Rule, I actually found that this history is the accurate history as opposed to mm -hmm. American history, which is a propaganda tool. It's a weapon. Sure. And so when I got that, – That must always preserve American and white innocence. Right, because it's a cult right. belief, right? Yes. And, the, yeah. and, and you go back to what you were saying about the incoherence about the cult belief. The moment that it starts un, unraveling, it's gone. But you right. have to continually retroact everything and retroengineer everything to make it try to become coherent, even though it never even approaches coherency. And right. I didn't expect to find the cult of the Shining City. Mm -hmm. But when I did, I, I have to tell you, man, it messed with my day. I, you know, because it was like, I, I did not expect to go into my beliefs or my upbringing and understand them more through this book. I kind of thought that I came from like a weird group of people that it, it, the, the research took you to a much more personal place than you were expecting. It was shocking, man. It really, really yeah. was. And, and the yeah. thing is I, for, I had this moment. So I have this really, really wonderful, uh, editor named Maria and, you know, Maria is straight laced and no nonsense. And I, I wanted this book to be as accurate and good as it could possibly do because I kind of felt like this was like one of my life's works. And so I just I, I called up Mari and I was just like, I have to tell you what I found. And mm. I need somebody outside of this to listen to it. <laughs> and I was just like, I have to find out, like, does this check out? And then all of a sudden, I started talking about it in public. And in the thread that you talked about is like one of the places where I've started to try and give this information out before the book comes out because September is mm -hmm. a long way away. Yeah. And so all of a sudden I started telling people about this and people started writing back and they're like, this checks out and checks so many boxes that I didn't even know were boxes. And I started to unravel it and it, it was just, it, it, it's a bizarre thing, but it's absolutely well, you know what it's true. Like, you know what it feels like? And, and, you know, I'm, I'm a bit older than you and I've been paying attention. You know, I read Howard Zinn's people's, people's history quite a while ago. And I've, you know, I was starting to feel like I, I, I've got a contrarian view of American history. Sure. But what you're describing is, you know, it's the it's the frog in the in the water that's heating up. Right. But then someone shows the frog, you know, a a calendar of all the times the temperature has been raised, and, <laughs> and, and explains the, water to the frog. Right, and for the first time ever, the frog is like, "Oh, holy fuck! This whole thing is is a contrivance." 
Exactly. And I never, that's the thing that I didn't understand about American history is because for the longest time, and again, because we grew up in the evangelical church, we are made, we, we are implanted with a paranoia, like a, like a, a constant fear that there are people, um, plotting against us. Right. And, and of that's, course. that's yeah. at the basis of, of evangelicalism is the idea that you are, even though if you control culture, you are constantly in danger of culture consuming you and destroying you. Yeah. And well, so, having been raised Mormon, you know, the whole, the, the story of Utah was that they came here to flee the United States and to build, live in this mountain, mountain fortress. And it is born out of this siege mentality. So it's right. exactly, and, 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 I mean, and the Christian mentality is all based upon <laughs> martyrdom, right. And the destruction yep. based under like Roman policy. And, and it all right. makes sense when you take that, but then all of a sudden when you start combining it with white supremacy, which has its own paranoia. Right. And one yeah. of the things that I have found in all of this is all of the conspiracy theories that we've ever come across. Right. The main ones. And these are mm -hmm. the ones that, um, unfortunately, the evangelical church has come to embrace, including, you know, the protocols of the elders of Zion, New World yep. Order, Deep State, QAnon, all yep. that shit. It's if you look at it, the conspirators, the ones who are always working with Satan and for the forces of evil, they're always women people of color and LGBTQ Americans and poor people. Right. And, and Jews. And don't Jews. Forget oh, the yeah. Jews. Don't forget the Jews either. And the though, Jews are the puppet masters behind the whole thing. Exactly. And the, and by yeah. the way, it turns out that they're always accusing Jews of controlling society the way that they control society, which is <laughs> just which is another production. thing. I didn't know that about protocols of the elders of Zion, but the protocols were actually a plagiarization of a uh, play that was a critique of white supremacist manipulation. They just changed hmm. the names. And Jeez. so what you find in all these conspiracy theories, those five groups that I just mentioned, remember, it's women, people of color, uh, LGBTQ, uh, poor people, and, and the Jewish people. Those five people are the uh, – it's everybody but white Americans. Yeah. Right? It's everybody who would trouble white supremacy. So these conspiracy theories are ways to manipulate people to believe that they're under attack by these other groups. And I yeah. didn't understand how we got there. But when I started piecing it together, again, it blew my mind because what ends up happening, and I had no idea about this because we're told that the evangelical right, and now I'm talking about the evangelical right as like the political group, right? Yeah. The group of people who basically took over the culture and fought the culture war starting in the 1980s. Yeah. I'm told, or I was taught, that they started gaining power and purchase based on the abortion debate. Right. Mm -hmm. That's how it's always told that they were they they, they that was a step too far. And they yeah. were they that, that was going to be it. That's not true at all. It was actually mm -hmm. desegregation in the 1950s and 1960s. Yeah, their, their, their reaction to the civil rights movement. It was completely their reaction to the civil rights movement. And so yeah. the main figure in all this is Jerry Falwell, Jerry Falwell Sr., by the way, who was a neo-Confederate preacher. The and I, a fucking scumbag. I love uh, what Christopher Hitchens said about him. If you gave him an enema, you could bury him in a shoebox. <laughs> I, man, I miss Christopher Hitchens. Don't we and miss Hitch? <laughs> I'll tell you what. I was just having this conversation with a buddy of mine the other day. What I wouldn't give for Christopher Hitchens and George Carlin to be alive during the Trump presidency. I would. I, I, unbelievable. No doubt. So, or Hunter Thompson. I'm sure he would have a thing to, to say about it. Yeah. But so you have um, – Jerry Falwell. And he actually was versed in the Confederate preaching that I was just talking about. It didn't mm -hmm. go away, right? He's still preaching that God has drawn, in his own words, that God had drawn a line of distinction between whites and blacks, and that that line yeah. should never be troubled. And if it was, if that line was ever troubled, it was actually troubling the word and belief of a racist God. Right. Hmm. So all of a sudden, and, and part of the reason this happens is because Martin Luther King Jr. starts using um, the social justice gospel of Christ to right. compel people for the civil rights movement. And it starts actually finding purchase with a large group of Americans. Right. Mm -hmm. And because it's compelling, everybody knows that regardless of how you feel about this, the gospel of social justice rings true. Right. And all of a sudden you start. It, it having... is one of it is one of the redeemable things about the Bible. Exactly. I'll try to think of another one, but you keep talking. 
Right. No, that's exactly right. I mean, we could be here all day. But, you know, it's it, it, whether you want to get into, um, you know, whether or not somebody is like a son of God or whether or not a gospel is true, the actual belief behind it, I mean, should short circuit every belief in white supremacy and segregation. Right. And, right. and uh, economic manipulation and political domination. So right. Martin Luther King starts using this and immediately Falwell and other neo-Confederate preachers, first of all, start calling him a communist, which is what mm -hmm. you do. And there's a long history in America where if somebody troubles anything, you call him a communist. The other thing he does is he starts moving towards this white identity, white supremacist, neo-Confederate identity belief that the way that you like it's actually again going back to what we we're talking about it's it's old testament it's rage yep. and war and smiting and, and retribution yeah yeah exactly and retribution and that and slavery and slavery right yeah. and everything that happens in america that is negative and by the way people who have heard pat robertson this doesn't sound surprising right yeah every time there's a hurricane it's the gays right yeah every time that there's an earthquake it's because you know abortion is legal yeah. So th this God is a different God than the one that somebody like a Martin Luther King is talking about. This mm -hmm. God is the God of the Confederacy. And this God is a white supremacist God. And so what ends up happening is you start having things like the prosperity gospel. They start talking about that you can tell God's will. And by the way, if you go back and read Adam Smith, and I feel sorry for you if you haven't already <laughs> and you have to do this. Yeah. Adam Smith says it's a chore. That, oh, it's rough. And on, on top yeah. of that, I, I, you know what? I'm feeling loose. It's a Friday afternoon. Fuck Adam Smith. So, <laughs> you know, Adam Smith gets out there in 1776 with the wealth of nations and is like, you know, this is how capitalism should work. And we should have an entire society based on self-interest. And he starts talking about the invisible hand in the market. Right. There will be an invisible mm -hmm. hand that makes things happen. Well, you know, Falwell and the others say, oh, that's God. And if you make a ton of mm. money and you are wealthy and you are powerful, then God is showing that he, his favor, right? Yeah. And, and by the way, what are the systems of capitalism and law and politics based on? White supremacy, right? Mm -hmm. So all of a sudden you have, again, a rinsing or a hiding of white supremacy behind the idea of God's favor. And he finds a willing partner in Ronald Reagan. Yeah. Yeah. And so let's talk about good old Ronnie. Let's talk about Ronnie. That so red, red baiting, <laughs> horrid, stupid piece of shit. Just I think, terrible. Yeah, I, I wonder if you can agree with me, Jared, that I think the myth of Reagan. Yep. Because I'm a person who was old enough to, to witness it as it was going on. And I was like, what the fuck is going on with this guy? Um, the myth of Reagan is one of the most pernicious myths in uh, in modern society and it's so it's so in, invasive that even people on the left have been completely drawn into this him as this kind of symbol of what americanness means john Kerry yesterday who is the former standard bearer of the democratic party came mm -hmm. out and said donald trump you need to be more like kennedy and reagan Right. Yeah. You hear Barack Obama praising him. You hear. And by the way, like this is another thing I learned in the book. We don't need to get off on a tangent. But the Democratic Party basically after Reagan was like, we will never defeat the myth of Reagan. We have to incorporate it into our party. Like this mm. thing is such an incredibly toxic myth. I mean, it's I wrote, so poisonous. Oh, it's <laughs> awful. I wrote a thread about it today that one of the reasons why people continue to say, why doesn't Donald Trump become more presidential is because it created in the presidency the symbol of American exceptionalism. And that's just bullshit. It's an executive position. You either lead or you don't. Right. It's a man you're a manager. You're a manager. So, yeah. <clears throat> so here's the thing about Ronald Reagan. And and this was another one of those days. And these were on different days. I didn't even know how they connected. I just thought that Reagan was like a really religious dude that they got in touch with and they decided to work with him. But right. that's not true. And all of a sudden I had to start looking into somebody like Jimmy Carter that I didn't know enough about. Right. And most of the people listening who don't know a lot about history, they're like, oh, Jimmy Carter is a nice ex-president, but he was probably a bad president and blah, 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 blah. Jimmy Carter was kind of an incredible leader who treated the American people like they were adults. And he told yeah. them what was going on and he talked about coming together. He basically gave them secular sermons because he was an incredibly religious guy. He, um, was, a, he was a truly deeply pious 
Christian. Absolutely. He, te- and, he still te- teaches Sunday school when he's not kicking cancer's ass. Like, right. I live in Georgia, and all anyone down here will talk about is A, meeting Jimmy Carter at some random function and him being the <laughs> nicest human being imaginable, and right. B, um, Jimmy Carter teaching Sunday school like days after he's been hospitalized, right? Yeah. And, and by the way, just so we're – because we're touching all the bases, let's go ahead and say this. If this country wasn't insane and if the mm-hmm. church wasn't insane, the kind of evangelical that you would deal with in America and in American society and politics would be Jimmy Carter, right? It would be yeah. somebody that you could have a conversation with and disagree with. It wouldn't be abusive and toxic and corrosive, right? Well, yeah, and he, but, but his, his particular form of Christianity was not weaponized. Exactly. And, and so, so the Christian right threw out an actual – Christian. Pious, it, it, uh, evangelical Christian for uh, an <laughs> empty-headed, vapid occultist. And we, listen, this is the thing that I didn't know, and it blew it blew my fucking mind. There's no yeah. other way to put it. It blew my fucking mind because what I found while I was doing research, because, you know, we've all heard those stories about Nancy Reagan talked to an astrologist and blah, 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 blah. But it turns out Ronald Reagan wasn't actually religious. He was spiritual and he was heavy, heavy, heavy into the occult. In fact, as president, um, his chief of staff, I want to say his name was Don Reagan, which is really weird that he had a chief of staff. I think it was Don Don Reagan. Reagan. I think it was Don Reagan. You know, I'm from Greene County, Indiana. I'm lucky I can tie my shoes. I'll I'll, I'll mess around (laughs) with pronunciations another day. Yeah, I'll I'll spit on you from my glass tower in Salt Lake City. (laughs) So uh, beautiful place. So yeah, it um, is. Don Regan writes this book and he basically sounds the alarm. It's it's like the modern, um, you know, tell all about Trump, right? Yeah. And he's like, listen, Ronald Reagan doesn't know what he's doing. He's completely incompetent. And by the way, everyone should know that he's telling state secrets to an astrologer. And right. right, like he's he's telling this astrologer uh, everything about where he's going. He's making meetings based on this stuff. He yeah, uh, the Reykjavik, Iceland was picked as the place for the summit with Gorbachev right. because of the stars. And he's telling them about negotiations with Russia, like and and so like it's like one of these things where and and if you go back and I found this um, um, YouTube video of it there because there's not much of this that exists in the public record anymore, but like there's all this stuff where it's like man. We really should talk about the fact that, like, he's probably, you know, like, breaking a lot of laws by doing this stuff. So, okay. So, again, the myth of Reagan's not real, right? And Reagan actually, um, as as an actor, in between informing for the FBI and turning in his fellow actors um, and getting them blacklisted for nothing – uh, and by the way, those were usually either women or LGBTQ Americans or of uh, actors of color. Isn't that weird how that turns out? Isn't that odd? Hmm. It's 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 almost like he had a racial. So many problem. coincidences in this it's story. Very weird. So yeah, in between all that, Reagan gets really really deep in the New Age scene in, in Hollywood, and he starts talking to like mystics. And mm. one of the people who is foremost at the head of this is a guy named Manly P. Hall. And everyone should look this guy up because this guy is fascinating. Yeah, I was not aware of him until I read it in your thread. And I was just like, how do I not know about this character? Oh, spend the weekend with Manly yeah. P. Hall. There's YouTube videos <laughs> of him. There's all kinds of stuff on him. Uh, I, I, I think I told you earlier, I was like, I, I kind of want to do a real deep dive on this guy. So Manly P. Hall runs across Reagan and Manly P. Hall is this mystic who talks about symbols and occultish meaning and lost meanings and lost symbols. And he se- and by the way, it's like he's selling out auditoriums. He's he has bestsellers. He is a celebrity mystic, right? And yeah. so his entire idea and his big opus is called the Secret History of America. And the Secret hmm. History of America says that. And and by the way, it involves Atlantis, right? <laughs> I, I know I know that's bizarre. That like a lot of people here who are listening are evangelicals who are like, how did Atlantis end up in all this stuff? And why did we always talk about things like Atlantis? It's uh, Manly so P. Hall. Funny. So he's talking about Atlantis. He's talking about the Illuminati. All these secret societies. That years and, and centuries ago, what am I talking about? Got together and they, they decided to carry out God's will and they were going to create hmm. a great society, right? And it was going to be a new society for a new age. And it was going to be like God's chosen country to carry out justice and the philosophy of humankind. And that's what, he, that's what the United States was. 
This is one of the reasons why Ronald Reagan believes in American exceptionalism the way he does. And then on top of it, Manly P. Hall sells Reagan on this idea that America was inspired and saved by an angel appearing at the Declaration of Independence. That um, <laughs> And there's this incredible myth, and I, I'm, I'm sorry to, to ramble on about this, but it's so batshit insane. He, <laughs> he, there's this myth that Manly P. Hall uh, pushes on Reagan, that this angel is at the Declaration of Independence, and all of the founders are really terrified to sign the Declaration, and they're not going to, right? It Because it could right. mean death. But this angel shows up and gives this impassioned speech, and then they all sign the Declaration of Independence, and they look, and he's gone. Dun, dun, he's, dun. he's just disappeared. Was he ever there? Was that an angel? I think that was an angel. So there's this idea, and Reagan being... Um, what's the word, an idiot, believes that this is true. And he starts dotting all of his speeches with this idea, right? And, and he, you, you told me that, that when, when Reagan spoke at CPAC, oh, that he, na- he name-checked this guy. He does. So at the very first CPAC, and for those listening who aren't aware, CPAC is like um, this major conservative conference where they test out their ideas and then they find their new leaders, all this stuff. It's, it's yeah, like it's the, the Legion of Doom. Every, it's the every Legion bad thing of Doom. So every the, bad policy that hurts poor people and queer people, et cetera, that comes out of that room. It comes out of CPAC. So at yeah. the first CPAC, 1974, Ronald Reagan gives an address to CPAC. And by the way, see if this, see if this hits anybody, the, the shining city, or shining city on the hill. Right. Which mm-hmm. is the main operating metaphor for the Republican Party and the United States of America since 1980. Right. This yep. is this is the leading idea that every president has to mention. Every politician has to mention all of it. He mentions it in this speech where he brings up Manley Hall and he brings up this idea that an angel at the uh, Declaration of Independence inspires all of it. Oh, by the way, that whole thing was completely made up, and it's part of a volume of popular fictions written by Edgar Allan Poe's best friend. So there's that. Jeez. And so Reagan gives this speech that defines the next 40 years based on the idea that America is God's chosen country in spiritual warfare with everybody else, right? So <laughs> in the 1980s, and and I know we can't do this for three hours, so we can't talk about all of it. In the the 1980s, under Reagan, what happens is there becomes this weird marriage between the evangelical right and their neo-Confederate hyper-capitalistic ideals with Reagan's hyper-capitalism and his occultism. And suddenly what's crazy is this confluence. And I I just am putting this together, this confluence of the um, neo-Confederate, you know, the uh, white American innocence and, and power. Right. And and a confluence of this crazy occultist, spiritualist uh, Ronald Reagan version of American exceptionalism and power. Uh, they they combine in the night, you know, the 1980 election like a Voltron. Exactly. Like a Voltron crazy. of white supremacy and, and, and an occultist an occult, a non-Christian occultist was the very symbol of America as the anti-occultist satanic panic raged under his watch exactly so what ends up (laughs) happening right exactly and so through a confluence of things and and i I don't know if you've talked about this on the podcast before but a couple of people to look into for further stuff here uh francis schaefer um Mm -hmm. who creates a thing called how then should we live which basically says Mm -hmm. that liberalism is destroying society and then you have uh hal Lindsay with the late great planet earth who writes Mm. this book that basically takes this new Christian secularism, um, you know, conservative political movement and combines it with the cold war plus new world, new world order ideology. And basically says we are living in the end times and that America is God's chosen champion. And of course, Ronald Reagan with it, by the way, Ronald Reagan as an idiot believes this brings it up in multiple meetings with people who are just like, what the hell are we talking about right now? And, you know, so we end up in this weird place in the 1980s. And anyone who lived through it remembers this satanic panic bullshit where, you know, Satan is trying to get to us constantly uh, through, you know, reverse songs, 
yeah. uh, movies. There are satanic sacrifices in every woods and every town. Children it tore are through my community. Oh, it, it was tore through it. It was a nightmare. And for people yeah. who either didn't grow up in the eighties or didn't grow up in these communities. You have no idea how real this was. It yeah. was, you know, it was every movie, television show that you watched. Um, my grandmother that I was speaking about, I can't tell you how many books about all this bullshit were in the house and floating around sermons about spiritual warfare and how we were in the end times. Yeah, my every misfortune that befell my community was somehow tied to it. My, exactly. You know, my, my scoutmaster died in a very unfortunate drowning accident and it was decided that they took it. The Satanists took him out because he was on to them. I mean, it makes total sense, right? When you really, yeah. you know, put it together, that's so tragic. It's awful. It's awful. And, and when you really look at it, it is a mass hysteria. And, you know, you can look at everything. And when you start looking at it through this lens and you start understanding it's about the marriage of political power and profit, you start realizing certain things, right? Like for those who aren't familiar, there was like this, um, there's a mass hysteria based around preschools where yeah. there was this idea that like every preschool was run by pedophiles who, you know, were abusing Satanist children, pedophiles. Satanist pedophiles. Well, the reason why is because preschools blew up because women started going to work and earning money for themselves. Well, you can't right. have that in a white patriarchal Christian theocracy, Right. Right. They're, right. Because your children, your child is going to get abused or killed. A woman's place is in the home. Exactly. And so all yeah. of a sudden you start looking at that. And then all of a sudden going back to what I said, it's like, well, you can't listen to rock and roll because Satan is on there. Right. It'll get you. And, yeah. and all of these things are about that paranoia that we've been talking about, that that fragility of white supremacy and, and white control and evangelical control and the paranoia of the religion paired with this. Again, bizarre, occultish, Reaganish belief. And then on top of it, we come to this point, and everyone who hears this, I'm sure, will feel it. There is the idea within conservative America that if you are poor and if you are suffering, you've done you're something failure. wrong. Yeah. Right? Yep. You deserve it because you have apparently not worked hard enough or been a good enough person. And suddenly our capitalistic society becomes an arbiter of God's will. And exactly. That, and, and that's it's, where it's we not, are now. It, it it people are taught to ignore it. That is it is a systemic problem. It is a system that creates immense poverty and and uh you know immense uh wealth inequality. But no, 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 it's because you failed. Exactly. Right. And and when you look at it through that lens, all of a sudden, evangelical, white identity, evangelical support of Donald Trump makes complete sense. Right. Because he is a white nationalist. He uh, he embodies this idea that only the wealthy are chosen by God. In fact, he went to these churches. He was married by Norman Vincent Peale, the founder of the power of positive thinking, prosperity gospel. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and, and, you know, on top of that, um you know, he is their quote unquote warrior against these outside attacks. And, you know, his wealth is proof that God is for him and he is the hypocrite that they all are. So all of a sudden, Trump isn't that far from them. He's actually one of them. And and when you actually compare him to Reagan and people don't know this, Reagan wasn't up to date on stuff. He didn't like right. briefings. He wanted his briefings as cartoons. He, yeah. he didn't work that much. He watched too much TV. He lied so much. It became one of the defining personality characteristics by which everybody knew him. And, and all of a sudden you look at Trump and you're like, oh, my God, it's this thing just playing itself out. And it makes all the sense in the world. It's not inexplicable anymore. So to sum up, I think what you're saying is that although the Confederate theocratic states of America lost on the battlefield, they ultimately won the political fight after they were washed in the blood of a dim-witted but opportunistic occultist president named Ronald Reagan and the supply-side corporatist prosperity gospel nightmare of a total fe total federal dysfunction and willful inaction in the face of crisis is the desired result of that nearly 150-year-long game. Well, I mean, if you want to put it that way, sure. <laughs> I mean, so I, I actually, I, I just saw this the other day. My my friend and historian, Heather Cox Richardson, has a new book out called uh, How the South Won the Civil War. And I was just like, mm. yeah, I need to read that. Um, I'm really excited about reading that. But I also think that if you really want a full understanding of this, like you also have to take a look at like Reconstruction and how actually, um, you know, all these other American lies have added up to this. Because what you're saying is, 
is exactly right. The South lost the war, but it won its fight for the identity of America because after the Civil War, there becomes this new, um, you know, mutant hybrid America that still has the white supremacy, but it can't be completely out in the open. Right. It has to be hidden behind the veneer of an America washed clean. And in that way, it is so much like what a church is. It has its aspirational ideals and its actual ideals. It's two sets or, you know, as some people would call it, an open and a closed system. The open system says, oh, yes, this is the land of opportunity and freedom and liberty. And the closed system says, hey, hold on a second. It's ours. And, And that is how this is operated and how the church is operated for God knows how long. Oy, oy, oy. Well, yeah, that was tiring. We, we could do this. I honestly, I could talk to you all day, but we better stop there. Uh, fascinating conversation. I can't tell you how much I appreciate it. Um, and I'm sure our listeners will too. And if they want to find more from you and about you, where can they do that, Jared? Sure. I blog over at themuckrake.com. I co-host the Muckrake podcast with my good friend, Nick Houselman on Twitter. I'm at JY Sexton and uh, yeah, my books are out there in the world. Yeah, please, uh, please follow him and pay attention because, uh, you know, theocracy is uh, kind of what's for dinner these days. So, all right. Well, thanks. Take care and uh, hope to talk to you again soon, Jared. Thanks, man. Well, friends, that's it for this week's show. Hey, we'd love to hear from you. Send us an email, howto at howtoheretic.com. Or if you're St. Augustine of Hippo, you can leave us a voicemail about why you're such a monstrous asshole at 903-88-HOW-2, which is 903-884-6986. You can also tweet me from Hippo. I'm on Twitter at HowToHeretic. And thanks to our incredible patrons, as always. And thanks so much to Cody Layton for editing the show. And thanks to all of you, dear friends, for tuning in. Bye, friends. Bye. Bye.